Welcome to the Well Woman Show, where we use intersectional feminism, mindfulness, leadership, and strategy to support smart women to change the world without anxiety, insecurity, and burnout. I want to do something that's cool, that's fun, that's meaningful, that makes a positive difference. And what that label has been has shifted over time. And second, to have a wonderful, juicy, fulfilling relationship with a male person, again, without a label attached. On the show, we challenge the status quo and support you to unlearn harmful messages that keep you playing small so you can activate your superpowers and live with joy, confidence, and ease. I'm your host, Giovanna Rossi. Hello, well women. Welcome, welcome. I hope you are doing well. Many people in my world are hunkering down for a uh, shelter-in-place Thanksgiving here in the U.S., And uh, wherever you are in the world, I hope that you are healthy and well. And if you are on the front lines, we thank you. And if you are caregiving, nurturing your kids, your parents, your business, your job, uh, your colleagues, then I want to thank you for that too. Uh, It's a whole lot of work right now just to keep Uh, keep at it. And uh, on the Well Woman Show, we want to recognize that. And also we want to go a step further and say, how can we thrive in these times and whatever that means to you? So we're going to explore today some of the challenges of creating a good income while also creating the impact you know you're here to make. So if you've been like thinking about this, if you've been challenged by this recently, if you're grappling with this, we go deep on this today. So on the show this week and to discuss how you can use your unique gifts for personal and collective benefit is my guest, Susanna Rinderly, writer, wisdom coach, wellness warrior, and workplace wizard. Based in LA now, Susanna has spent nearly 30 years garnering meaningful results for her employers and clients across the US and abroad in multiple sectors, including nonprofit, corporate, healthcare, education, and government. She's a certified professional coach and a certified facilitator of the Resilience Toolkit. Susanna's first career was in diversity and inclusion and intercultural communication. She held a university position in Guadalajara, Mexico, and was the co-founder and first manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the University of New Mexico Hospitals. For 20 years, she was the president of Susanna Rinderly Consulting, LLC, and is a former principal consultant for Corn. Ferry in the leadership development practice. Susanna is a former TEDx speaker, and her articles have appeared in Workforce Magazine and the Huffington Post, among others. Today, we talk about why you can't think your way out of stress and trauma, how we can be fulfilled while working and making an income, and why working on yourself can still help you shift the whole system. You can find more info and links at wellwomanlife.com slash 228 show. You can also continue the conversation with us in the Well Woman Life community group at wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook. The Well Woman Show is thankful for support from the Well Woman Academy and High Desert Yoga at highdesertyoga.com. Now to my interview with Susanna Rinderly. I'm speaking with Susanna Rinderly. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Giovanna. It's great to be here and it's great to be with a lot of other well women. Yes, it's awesome to have you here. Um, Susanna, let's start by just having you tell listeners who are you in the world today? Oh, my goodness. That's a big and juicy question. <laughs> um, who I am in the world is a person that's here to learn and grow as much as possible and help others do the same. With my particular personality type and soul, really, my work is an expression of who I am. So values wise, I'm really committed to integrity, authenticity, beauty, justice, self-expression, and creating a world that works better for more of us. And my vision for the world is that we create a place where every person receives all the knowledge and skills necessary to live their healthiest, happiest life, which is cool because I know that's part of what Well Women, uh, the Well Women Show is here to do. And in doing so, fully contribute our unique gifts for both personal as well as collective benefit. 
So in my work, I help heal what ails us through creativity, heart, and insight. And as you just described, I do that as a writer, a wisdom coach, a wellness warrior, and a workplace wizard. I love it. Okay. There's so much there to talk about. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) So I want to ask you, you said your work is an expression of who you are. And Mm -hmm. I just wonder, like, when did that happen for you? Because I think sometimes people would like for that to be the case. But yeah, wh- when did that happen for you and how? Well, my, uh, for those folks that lo- are, are love personality types and organ and, and assessments and things like that, I'm a four on the Enneagram and I'm an INFJ on the Myers-Briggs. Both of those are one of the rarest types. And what I just described is part of what we bring into the world is wanting to live a life that is unique and, you know, creating positive change and really connected with emotion as well as mind and and soul and intuition and spirit. So I guess it's part of my awareness as long as I can remember, Giovanna, like I remember being a kid and the the only two goals I ever had for myself even even as a child was to have a cool job and that's as far as it went it wasn't I want to be x but I want to do something that's cool that's fun that's meaningful that makes a positive difference and what that label has been has shifted over time and second to have a wonderful juicy fulfilling relationship with a male person again without a label attached So I guess it was always kind of something that I, you know, I wanted whatever my work for pay would be, would be something that engaged me, was meaningful and made a positive change. So while that was always part of my consciousness, I guess that's also part of the values that drove the way I did my work in the 20s, which was try a lot of different things in a lot of different places and start in my 30s to sort of notice what some of the different threads were that connected everything and start to craft a life out of that. And the way that's looked has been different and is still shifting now at age 50. But, um, you know, pursuit of meaning and meaningfulness is just one of the drivers for me and for people that are similar in type. Yeah, I love that. And I just want to notice that you seem quite unusual, as you (laughs) pointed out with Uh your, your personality tests. But I think because I think for for a lot of people, this notion that we can create a life um, that is meaningful is not always obvious. Like it, I, I yeah. think people grow up in this sort of patriarchal system, thinking that there are certain things that you just have to do, uh, mm-hmm. and. and And I think we're evolving, right? I I think we're, I think more people are realizing like, oh, we can, you know, we can actually like be fulfilled while we, while we do the thing. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, do you, do you want to speak to that at all? Like how, um, how, how so many people are sort of waking up to this idea that like they can, they can live these fulfilling lives. Oh, yeah. Again, that's a really uh, yummy question, Giovanna. I mean, it's a tough one. And I think it's a both and because you just called patriarchy, called out patriarchy. I also want to call out um, racism and the various forms of oppression that we experience externally and also internalize into ourselves. And I am very much an advocate if, if folks read my articles that You know, we also have to just be really radically honest and not put glitter on ish (laughs) about the reality of the world, which is that I also enjoy a tremendous amount of privileges that allow me to do that more than some others might. What do I mean by that? I mean, for example, that for whatever reason, not due to any any of my grit or my will or my you know, hard work, I happen to have a brain that's not just creative and intuitive, but also very scientific. That scientific analytical brain, because that kind of thinking and being is privileged in the world, I am able to make a lot more income through that brain than I am through the creative and intuitive. I have very close people that I know, colleagues as well as as dear friends, that don't have that particular type of brain. And so they struggle more to make money to allow them to exist in a three-dimensional world, even though they they are equally as talented and valuable as people. 
So I, I sort of want to make sure that that's said out loud. I'm not a believer in this sort of BS, individualistic, hyper capitalist, you know, meme that and trope that sort of goes through our society is that anyone can make it big and all you need is talent and really hard work. That's not true. There's a lot of people who are very talented and work very hard, but their skills and their brains and their souls are not necessarily as aligned with what it is that makes money in our current system. So while I definitely think that many people have an opportunity to explore, and that's sometimes with the guidance of a therapist, a coach, an ally, spirituality, shows like this to really get clearer about who am I, who have I always been, who do I want, who do I want to be, what are my values, what drives me, and how can I live more in alignment with that, having an expectation that a hundred percent is the goal or that the only thing standing in my way to doing that is my own, you know, um, hard work and talent, I think really leaves a lot of people high and dry and is not fair. So I think it's sort of a both end, but within the current reality of the systems that we live in and that we are all trying, many of us are trying to dismantle and shift. Where do we find the balance that works for us and that is sustainable? So a lot of the things that I do are not my favorite thing. And yet I am at peace with understanding that this is, these are things that I am still saying yes to that aren't necessarily my hundred percent love, but they, um, I do them because they allow me to have the type of life that lets me you know, do the other things that maybe are less lucrative. So I know that was a long answer, but yeah, that, no, but did that make sense? Uh, that's good because I think there are a lot of listeners who maybe are, are trying to do the thing mm-hmm. that is creative and that, you know, really, really that their heart wants to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, it's like, well, I've, you know, I've, I've, put myself through all of this training and, and developing this career in a, in whatever other field, you know, mm-hmm. um, how do you, you know, how do you reconcile that? And, and so what you're saying is like, it doesn't have to be either, or you can do both. Yeah. And, or find what balance you can live with, you know, instead of, instead of being in a victim mentality that, uh, you know, and, 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 and that's also tricky because we are victimized by the system. So I might be a victim, but maybe I don't need to be bought into victimhood. So instead of resenting that there, these are these things that I need to do in order to make enough income to create spaciousness in my life for writing creativity and to live in a neighborhood that supports my need to have green space and neighbors and thing, you know, good neighbors and things like that. I take ownership for and sit more in more gratitude around, yeah, this, 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 these parts kind of suck, but this, these are the problems I'd rather have. Mm, Yeah. And speaking about the systems that we've both talked about here, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I have worked for many years in systems change and, and social Mm. justice and, and you have a, a background in, in a lot of the sort of systemic oppressions and things. And Mm -hmm. Uh, I do believe that it's it's going to take leadership uh, that steps outside beyond the, the confines of this of these systems that are so oppressive, kind of forge new path pathways. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so, a lot of what I work on is is like trying to make some headway in that. And I think that there are ways that that can happen, both by supporting people individually, which is what I do with the well woman work, but mm-hmm. then also doing, doing things more on a systems level, mm-hmm. with, with some of the external things. So in your new business, words, wisdom, and wellness, do you, how, how do you, how do you like reconcile those two, like the internal and the external? Oh, that's such a great question, Giovanna, because you've actually just hit on one of the dichotomies that I have been curious about and shifting the ways that I approach the world as I age and evolve. Um, And so I have found myself, I found myself when I was a younger adult, focusing more on systemic change. Um, You know, I started out as a social worker in nonprofits the month after the uprising slash riots in 1992 here in my native Los Angeles, you know, held, held positions in different institutions in higher ed and healthcare um, in the United States. 
United States and in, in uh, internationally in Mexico, and been not at a high C-suite level of leadership, but been been a change agent, been a catalyst, been a middle level level leader in in trying to move that change. In some ways, I was successful. In some ways, not so successful, and learned a lot and taught a lot along the way. And I found that in my middle adulthood, I'm being called more. And, and, and again, kind of similar to my previous question, I think it's a bit of a both and, you know, my worldview is fractals, uh, that everything is connected. We are in ourselves microcosms of the larger macrocosm. And the macrocosm is a combination of and an expansion of all of our individual microcosms. Mm. So they're very connected. When we in, when we work on the individual micro level, we are shifting the system. And when we shift the system, we are also shifting what is possible and what is true for individuals. And yet I find that as I'm moving more into middle age, I'm feeling called more towards leaning into the individual. And that's for a variety of reasons that I don't have entire control or choice over. It's just what I find myself being drawn to and having energy for. So, you know, I really believe that what the world needs more of, there's a cool kind of Venn diagram in some career development and like personal development work where it looks at, you know, what are your talents? So in other words, what are you skilled at? What are you good at? Um, what can you, can you do? What do you do? Then there's passion. So what, what moves your heart? What moves your soul? What really gets you, you know, energized? And then there's, there's need. So the need in the world or the need in an organization and where those three intersect is sort of the sweet spot. So what I believe the sweet spot is on my Venn diagram of those three at this point is around intuition and emotion and art. Mm -hmm. I feel like we, we have so many solutions. We have so many possibilities. We have so many problems. We have so many successes. It's really overwhelming. And we could probably talk for a whole hour about why that is. Um, Because I think some of it is just where we've evolved as a society, both in the United States and globally, but also some intention there is my personal belief. And yet, you know, what I find we need more of is heart and creativity and uh, reassurance. So that's why my sort of work mission is I help heal what ails us through creativity, heart, and insight. So doing that as a writer, doing that as a coach, doing that as a wellness warrior in my stress and resilience work, doing that um, a little bit bigger with organizations around leadership development, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so yeah. that's where I feel like I have more bandwidth now and more energy and just more spark is working more individually. Yeah, I love that you described that because I, I really relate to that in, in that I also, you know, as I said, I worked in a lot of systems change work. Mm-hmm. And what I noticed was that it, it didn't matter how many millions of dollars we threw at a problem if the leadership in these organizations was not working and, yeah. and there was bad leadership. And, yeah. um, and so I just, you know, more and more have been working on the individual level. Like, how can we, mm-hmm. you know, how can I support, especially women yeah. leaders to really reach that level where they can really make the impact that I know that, you know, that they want to make? Yeah. And I love that you said that because for me, it's also a subtle but very powerful shift. You know, the word leadership oftentimes doesn't quite sit right in women's mouths. And I know that was me for a long time until because for me, what my culture taught me was that leadership looked a certain way, which was very directive, very power over, very patriarchal. Leadership, especially even historically, there are many different types, all of which are very powerful. And I think what the archetypically, when I say archetypically feminine, I don't mean that only women do this or only women should or only only women can, but the archetypically feminine approach to leadership is how do we be different, not just how do we do different. So there's a lot of well-intended, smart, good-hearted leaders out there that are doing different behaviors, but from the old way of being. And a lot of times nothing's shifting because they're still bought into the old paradigm or the old beliefs or ways of doing things. So I think it's we're being invited to a different concept of leadership. We're being invited to not just do differently, but be different. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and, and as yeah. women, I think we have an opportunity to, to do that in and, all and areas of our lives. Absolutely. And as you said, it's not just that women can do this, it, you know, mm-hmm. men can also embody these, this way of being rather than doing, but it does take courage mm-hmm. because yeah. it's not totally acceptable in, in, or, or the norm, or even, you know, recognized as leadership, like you said. We'll be right back. I'm so thankful for support from High Desert Yoga, promoting optimum physical health, clarity of mind, and spiritual inspiration for all. You're invited to join me for a brand new monthly group experience over in the Well Woman Academy. This is a monthly group that includes access to the full six-week course based on feminism, mindfulness, and the Well Woman Life Framework. It includes weekly groups, coaching sessions with me, as well as office hours and a private Facebook group to share and grow. Don't get me wrong, this is hard work. But with these tools, you will easily find the time to do the course, get the coaching, and reach your goals monthly. If you find yourself worrying about whether you'll ever make it in the thing you're pursuing, waking up in the middle of the night with anxiety, lacking the energy you need to get everything done, stuck in some aspect of leading your team, procrastinating on moving forward with projects and tasks, or in a leadership role but second-guessing yourself constantly, I'd love to introduce you to the Well Woman Academy. It's for smart, high-achieving women changing the world who want to overcome anxiety, burnout, perfection, and insecurity. The result? You get to live your well woman life, a life of joy, ease, and abundance, even when things are tough all around you. Visit wellwomanlife.com slash academy to learn more. We're back on the Well Woman Show. Good. Okay. Well, we're going to head into the segment called Superpowers for Success. I'm going to ask you sort of a lightning round of questions so that listeners can get to know you uh, even better. The first question I have for you, Susanna, is what does success in life mean for you? And that is the question that I believe more of us should be asking ourselves because what really feeds us and makes our life feel fulfilling isn't always what our culture tells us. And so so what success looks like for me is, I think this is a paraphrase of David White, good work, done well, done for the right reasons. And so kind of on a daily basis, more days than not, having that feeling. So that would be sort of the short term or the daily check-in. And then over long term, it's the two things I described before. If I am able to have a cool job, (laughs) however defined, that gives me that sense of satisfaction and also makes a positive difference that I leave the world better than the way I found it for the most part. And having juicy relationship with my partner, with my friends, with my family. That for me is is really the bottom line. And the downside of that is I haven't focused as much on financial abundance as I might have, but um, I wouldn't trade the way I did my 20s and 30s and 40s for the world. Mm, That's good to know because I think listeners you know, want to know some of these timeframes sometimes. Mm-hmm. And like your path was definitely not linear. And whenever I mentor younger women, I, I always say like, you know, you can have all these plans right now, but just know that things are going to shift. Things are going to change. It's going to be a winding road <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that's okay. Like that mm-hmm. doesn't, doesn't have to be this linear sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think in some ways our culture supports that more now than when maybe you or I were, were younger. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I never really had anyone say any mean things to me when I was sort of being this, you know, butterfly. Um, but to, in the 90s, that was not common. Um, yeah. And now I think, you know, for, for good reasons as well as problematic, there's a lot of volatility and uncertainty and ambiguity and just a constant rapid change that's very disorienting to humans. But one of the opportunities in that is you can turn on a dime and it's no longer expected that young women or even young men join an organization and stay there for 30 years. Yeah. You can move organizations, you can shift careers, you can create a business even easier than in, in the past. So in a yeah. lot of ways, having more options is great, but it can also make things more daunting because there's more choices. Okay, so when did you know you were really good at what you do? 
I guess I'm still figuring that out. You know, for me, it's always been trying to figure out what am I really good at? Because when you are a multiple minority like me, when you enjoy some of the privileges that I enjoy in terms of intellect and some aspects of my educational and class background, it's sort of like, well, I can do so many things. So what really am I good at? And that's where not having effective mentors was one of my obstacles. So I really um, always advocate, we were speaking about younger women to find mentors. And I love being a mentor at this stage in my life, being the auntie and the old big sister and the the formal Mm -hmm. mentor. But I guess, um, I guess a part of me always knew. I always knew I was a writer. I've always been a writer. I've always been an empath. I've always been sensitive and intuitive. I've always been good at communicating. I've always been good at problem solving, figuring out how to, you know, meet the world's need and make a living through that has been an ongoing process that I'm still figuring out and is still evolving. Yeah. What do you mean by multiple minorities? Oh, so um, this may sound arrogant, but it's it's true. So I have a high IQ. So, you know, navigating the world as a person with IQ wise, high intelligence, but also being in a female body has led to uh, some pain and some disconnects throughout my life. Um, I grew up in a very unusual situation in terms of race, class, culture and language. So Well, as far as I know, um, I am biologically white. I have grown up mostly around people of color. I'm a fluent Spanish speaker, often pass as a woman of color and have had to come out as white um, more than one time in my personal and professional um, life. I am a a rare personality type, as I mentioned, and I'm also neurodivergent. So, you know, I have uh, had challenges with my brain working well and have struggled with mental and emotional health issues since I was 10 and just kind of being a bit of an oddball and a unicorn, um, which is also what makes me really good at working with other oddballs and unicorns, but (laughs) it's not always fun to be the oddball, especially when you're just trying to be you. And then you get sort of the like, what? (laughs) Not everybody operates that way. So I I just want to pick up on that because I feel like I just want to say most people feel like the oddball. Like I, I, I just, Mm -hmm. whenever I, whenever I talk to people in depth, it's like everyone feels like the odd one out. And Mm -hmm. and in certain ways you really were like, you really had these actual, you know, things. And uh, at the same time, you know, I, I do think that it's something that we, you know, sort of grow up thinking. And then at some point in our development, we we reconcile that with sort of what, like, what does that, you know, what does that mean for me? How am I going to either overcome that or use that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And then I would also add, and also how are those differences positioned by society? Because yes, you're right. All people, you know, in fact, in my TEDx talk, that was sort of one of the questions I posit to the audience is how many of you have ever felt left out or felt like you were the odd one? And, And I've asked this question of groups of everything from 10 people to 800, and most people raise their hand. That's because the human nervous system is extremely wired to be very aware of when we feel or are being excluded because as a 2 million year old species, when we were being ostracized or excluded, that was an, a literal threat to our lives. So our nervous systems, as all humans, are very attuned to that. However, not all differences are the same. And while everyone has had that experience, not everyone has that experience every hour of every day or along the lines of identities that um, may not be appreciated, that may not be included, that are seen as inferior and seen as less than. Mm-hmm. So as a person who walks around in a body that gets a lot of privilege, but also is very, I'm very gender nonconforming, There are ways that, you know, people make assumptions that are inaccurate in ways that favor me, but also ways that don't favor me. And so when people have those experiences of being different, not all those differences are the same. Um, There's a great article written by um, Anand, and I'm going to, this is embarrassing because the article is about names and I can't, I don't remember how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> but he, he talks about how, you know, politicians and, and folks are purposefully dispronouncing Kamala Harris's name right now on the political stage. Mm-hmm. And he talks about how being an American of Indian descent with the name Anand, that was his experience as well. And so it's, it's, it's different walking around the world with a name that is constantly being missed or dispronounced in a way of making one feel less than. Um, So those differences are not all the same, right? 
Yes. Okay. So we only have a few minutes left and I want to get through a few more questions. So we're going to do mm-hmm. the rest of them shorter. So describe a personal habit that contributes to your well-being. Well, some of your readers and you might be familiar with Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. Yeah. And I did that did that book with a group of women earlier this year and started the habit of doing the morning pages. And um, while I don't do three pages every morning, I do a page almost every morning. And that is a really helpful practice yeah. in terms of just downloading what's on my mind and heart as I begin my day and just sort Absolutely. of centering myself. I love that. I was just talking about morning pages with a, oh. another with a group earlier. For those of you listening and for you, Susanna, I had Julia Cameron on my show and we'll put a link to her interview in the show notes Mm -hmm. since we're since we mentioned her, but morning pages, great. I highly recommend that mm-hmm. to everybody. What superpower did you discover you had only to realize it was there all the time? Oh, wow. I love these questions. Intuition. My, I grew up in a household of a very creative and art, art, artistic and artisan mother and a scientist father. And for a variety of reasons that are not either of their faults, their own trauma, um, I think that sensitivity and that intuition wasn't appreciated. And so I I kind of stopped listening to it. Mm -hmm. So as I grew up and I healed and I started to realize that that was there and that was always going to keep me safe and I started to learn and grow it, I realized it had been there all the time. It's a very fierce ally and it's also a very feminine force in terms of faith and knowing what we know without necessarily always having the evidence, but knowing that it is true and that it is right and that it is powerful. Okay. What advice would you give your 25 or 30 year old self? Short answer, one sentence. The tagline for my business, which is you're not bad, you're not crazy, and you're not alone. (laughs) Okay. I love that. (laughs) That's awesome. Okay. Do you identify as a feminist? Absolutely. And just real quick, what does that mean for you? That I have the radical notion that women are, can be, and should be equal to men. Not the same as men, but that what we manifest, what we bring, intelligence, our beauty, our humor, our insights, our heart should be valued as much as that which is archetypally male. And Susan, I know you've done a lot of work on diversity and equity Mm -hmm. and anti-racism. So I, I usually use the terminology intersectional feminist. Do you talk about that in that way? How do you, how do you want to talk about that? Uh, Again, I think this is a great both and, which by the way, I think the both and way of thinking not only is a, is the way of thinking for most cultures around the world, it is a more inclusive and more archetypally feminine way of thinking. It's not a binary. It's not Mm -hmm. this or that white or black male or female up or down straight or gay, you know, both and. And real life and nature, which we are a part of, is Much great. Fluid, it's yeah. both and, yeah. And so I think any next gen, next paradigm, new thought way of thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion has got to be both and. We aren't just one box. We aren't just one identity. And we're not just even one person in every situation that we're in. That's that's how life works. That's who we are. And so you can't separate out gender from race from uh, sexual orientation, from class, from age, et cetera. It was important that we separated those identities out um, some decades ago so that we could sort of really look at those and unpack. But in terms of how we really, as humans, show up in the world, it's much more complex than that. Yeah. Okay. Last question. What are Mm -hmm. you reading right now? What's on your nightstand? Ooh, I've got three books. Um, a lot of the work that I do, the work, the wellness work that I do is around somatics and uh, trauma-informed, social justice-oriented, body-based stress management resilience. So I'm currently reading Waking the Tiger, almost done by Peter Levine. Um, the Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Like those two mm. books have changed my life and many others. And then also I'm about midway through Sapiens, Um, which is just as a evolutionary biology and brain science nerd, it really is blowing up my assumptions about who we are as humans and as a species and what, how some of those mistaken beliefs about who and what we are as a species are driving some of the biggest problems we face as, as humanity right now. 
I love it. Lisa <laughs> Rinderly, yeah. principal founder and owner of Words, Wisdom, and Wellness. I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me, Giovanna. And thank you so much for this work that you do with the Well Woman Show. It's, it's part of the solution. And I'm very honored to be here with you in the space. That's it for our show today. Remember, if you need support to live your Well Woman life, head over to wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook to join our community. As a reminder, we are on NPR every week, so be sure to tune in at npr.org slash podcasts and search for The Well Woman Show. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment and subscribe and leave a review. This helps raise visibility, which is super helpful when it comes to producing the show every week. For feedback, comments, or just to let me know you were listening, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Well Woman Life. I'm Giovanna Rossi for The Well Woman Show. Until next time, have a super powerful week.